This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Rob Smith and to Alice Phelan, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 546 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley author of the book Save Me, Please, and Other Stories. Publishers Weekly writes, Visceral settings and robust characters will have readers marveling at how much Kirtley is able to fit into a limited page count. For SFF fans with no time to sink into a doorstopper, these concentrated doses of genre goodness will hit the spot. So again, the book is called Save Me, Please, and Other Stories, and it's available now on Amazon.com. And our guest today is John Romero one of the creators of the popular video games Doom, Quake, and Wolfenstein 3D. His new memoir, Doom Guy, Life in First Person, describes his tumultuous childhood, his spectacular success as one of the founders of id Software, the collapse of his company Ionstorm, and his recent projects, which include a host of new Doom levels and an upcoming first-person shooter video game. And now here's our interview with John Romero. All right, so we're here with John Romero. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. This is going to be great. Okay, and so your new book is called Doom Guy, Life in First Person. So how'd this book come about? Uh, let's see. I was giving a talk in Canada, and the, uh, the organizers, instead of having me talk about one of my games, they asked if I would talk about my life before I started making games. And then, you know, kind of cover the game stuff. But they, they wanted to know, like, how did I get to be a person who would make these kinds of games? Because they hadn't heard anything about that part of my life. So I was like, all right, I've never had that request. That's cool. So I wrote a talk that was called my Li- uh, A Life in Games. And I gave the talk with all the family stuff and how I grew up in Arizona and everything at the very beginning. And people were, like, really shocked at all the <laughs> bunch of the stuff that <laughs> happened there. And afterwards, somebody had had mentioned, you know what? This this should really be in a book, and I thought I, I was thinking about it, and I was like, yeah, that would be. No one has that information. Plus, they don't have a lot of the last you know twenty years or so. Um, so you know that would be. I could probably couple that with id software. Um, a lot of really in depth id software information make it kind of an id software history book plus my autobiography. And uh, and so I thought that, yeah, it's a good combo. You know, if if people want to know exactly when Hover Tank 1 was <laughs> developed, you know, uh, they could find that out in this book, you know. Yeah, I mean, just to give people an idea of the of the family stuff, the childhood stuff, one thing that sticks out in my mind is there. there's a part where you're a teenager and you're bored and you just get your dad's rifle, which is apparently just lying around and just start shooting at some of the other um sort of trailers uh, out the window, just uh, not really thinking that you might hit anyone or anything. It's just, uh, yep. you know, just pure boredom. Yeah, totally. Like it was, it was just really crazy. Cause I don't think, you know, I'm horrified that I did that. That was really unbelievable. And I've thought about that many times over the years. It was just like, wow, like <laughs> that was, that could have ended up bad, you know, just, yeah, yeah there were a lot of things that happened back then. Do you think this is a pretty unusual background for a game designer? Have you talked to any other game designers who had a childhood like yours? Yeah. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, it is it is kind of unique, especially if you talk about someone like Tom Hall, guy that I worked with for a long time. He had a really, um, you know, his parents were, I think, in their 40s when they had him. And he was you know, living in Wisconsin. So he was, you know, he had a really great childhood. Um, I know at least one other person who had a very difficult childhood. Um, I can't re- reveal their backstory. You know, Brenda, even my wife, she comes from a low-income family. 
Um, but you know, I think there's probably several people out there that have a similar, a similar, um, story, which is kind of part of the reason why I wanted to talk about my, my, you know, how I, how I grew up, because if anybody else is in a situation similar to that, you know, I think that they would find hope and, and, uh, you know, some, some, maybe a pathway through what they're doing, what they're, what they're going through, um, to uh to success you know coming from difficult back backgrounds um kind of improves your imagination you know because you don't have any you don't have anything no toys you don't have anything so you gotta have to like um create your own fun and you know you have to believe in in something that's is gonna get you know things are gonna get better yeah well and speaking of brenda you say in the acknowledgments my wife brenda encouraged me to tell my life story and helped me to write and edit these chapters could you talk a little bit more about what that um, collaborative process was like? Yeah. So I, I have a thing called hyperthymesia, which is, um, uh, like a superior autobiographical recall. So I, I remember my past really, really well. And one of the, um, one of the aspects of my memory there is that I think that like everything is important, <laughs> even if <laughs> even small, you know, details, I think they're important, but when you have someone who, has been in the industry for, for, you know, you know, even longer than me, he's my wife. She can see all the, you know, I can tell her all of the things that happen and she can take the parts out that are really, you know, the most important ones. And, uh, and so, she, so it was like, I, I did a big, huge ROM dump basically of everything. Hmm. And then she could pick it all out and, and, uh, and make sure that those were highlighted correctly, you know, and, 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 you know, she knew, you know, what was historical, you know, I did have like really long chapters, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it was important. It was important to have that editing process down to to really get it down to the things that were the most important stories to to kind of convey all the stuff that's happened in my life. Uh, so there could theoretically be like a director's cut of this that's like a thousand pages long with the. Yeah, with the... yeah, because yeah, we cut probably uh, thirty thousand words out. Um, just because, and not that we would put it out there, but <laughs> there were like 30,000 words that we cut because there's only so many pages that we can get, you know, put in the book. Um, so yeah, we had to decide which stories we're going to go. Yeah. Is this the first book that you've written or tried to write or thought about writing? Uh, let's see. I've written a couple books, never published, which are, um, like game programming books. You know, when I was, uh, when I was in school. I was writing some game programming books, um, written a book on programming, uh, like for people to start programming in Lua and making games in Lua. Um, but this is this is the first like real book, <laughs> like really big one. So was it uh, harder than you expected, easier than you expected? Much harder. It took a really long time. <laughs> and like especially how, having like to... Long? A year at least. Um, yeah, just it, it was a ton of time. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of painstaking um, research into making sure that the dates that I had was, were absolutely correct because I wanted to make sure that this was going to be an authoritative book about its games. So that was important to me. Um, and it was like not not only just like what I can recall myself, but also just researching to make sure that that uh, certain places agree with that. Um, then there's like you know six months of editing, um, and I'm 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 a working game developer, you know, so all of that is uh, threaded between professional day to day life as well. So um, yeah, I mean was. Was part of your motivation to correct the record on some things? Because there are a bunch of places in the book where you say, you know, it's been reported that such and such, or you may have heard such and such, and I want to correct the record there. Yeah, not, I mean, I'm not trying to right wrongs or anything like that. Not, not, not that. There are things I've heard over the years that are like, I've heard stories that never happened or things that are really close to what happened, but not absolutely correct. So um, it was important that that uh, that I could kind of say this is what I remember. This is the story that I remember 
uh, about this certain thing. You know, um, I've heard that this has happened, this, that this had, had happened. And I and I'm going to say, here's here's the way that I had that happen. So I had a lot of footnotes sure. in there for people to um, to kind of read a little bit more detail into some of those things for people who may have heard stories told a different way, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, just to give an example, I mean, I just heard this story over and over again that John Carmack had seen Ultima Underworld running and said, oh, I could do that, except to make it a lot faster. And yeah, so I was yeah. a no, disconcerted that, that to was, find out that's not, that never happened. It never happened. Um, yeah, I think that might even be in the Wikipedia for Catacomb 3D's texture mapping part. Um, but yeah, that that's that's one, one of those stories, yeah. Mm. Um, you also, you, in the acknowledgments, you say thanks to David Craddock. He's been on the show a couple of times. Uh, you call him the foremost chronicler of FPS history for your review and feedback on critical chapters. Could you talk about what, uh, what sort of feedback he gave you on the book? Yeah, he definitely is. Um, he, he, he's, he's just awesome. Uh, he's, he's, you know, and the FPS doc, I think that, that, uh, everybody knows the FPS documentary is coming out. Um, he's asked so many people in the, sh in, in, in shooters, uh, a ton of stuff. He, he knows more, you know, he, because of that, he knows more that other people don't have. He has lots of really great questions. I wanted to make sure that what was important to him, uh, as a, as an FPS authority that I put that information in this book. So he was an early reader and it was really important for me that he could see, you know, uh what, what part is he interested in he wants to know all about quake okay check it out here's <laughs> here's quake you know and his feedback was super critical because um i wanted to make sure that what i was giving you know the information i was putting out there was what somebody would want to read so he's one of the people who um would say hey it's been reported elsewhere x y and z you know and and then i could actually um no, so some of those footnotes kind of came out of that, you know, from his suggestions. Yeah, well, that that FPS there's there's a new documentary called First Person Shooter. Uh, it's like some, the definitive history of first person shooters or something like that. Yeah. And uh, he sent me a copy of it. I just watched it. It's you know I, I fired it up and it's four and a half hours long. And I was like, wow, this seems like a really long documentary. But I yeah. uh, I had no trouble watching the whole thing. It was really really fun. I haven't seen it yet. But I know that I recorded five and a half hours just with him. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see him last night? He said you you were gonna. Are you at San Diego Comic Con right now? Yeah, yeah. I I was I was with him yesterday. Um, there was a panel uh, that was about the book, and so he asked me a lot of really great questions. Um, and the audience was you know just really enthusiastic and really supportive and really great. And a lot of those people afterward came to the book signing, um, and uh, and and a lot of them gave me more feedback, you know, in, in when I was signing their books. So yeah, it was a really great event. David's just awesome. He knows so much stuff, you know. He was just like just the right guy to to do this, um, to do that documentary, to to do the the panel at Comic Con, asking me these questions about my book. Um, yeah, he's just he's just great. So what sort of questions and what sort of feedback have you been getting from from people who have read the book? Um, there's people who um, they really love the positive tone of the book. It's not a tell all kind of thing. It doesn't feel like that. You know, it's it's a book that that people feel that they get the and I even say this at the ending. I'm super grateful that I have a life in games that I was able to do what I wanted to do since I was a little kid and do it for my whole life and that um you know there's th this book i have no bridges to burn or axes to grind anything that went wrong i totally own it it's in the book you know like we talk i talk about ion storm what went wrong i take you know take all responsibility for that in the book and um and so people really just like the fact that there's a lot of uh it's just a positive energy book you know um, and, uh, and there's a lot of relatable situations and feelings in the book that people have, um, you know, when they're reading it, they just, they feel it, you know, and they've been in those situations. And, um, and I talk about 
things like, you know, like my influences, people that I've met, uh, you know, whose whose work meant a lot to me, like Nasser Jabelli. Um, he's been, you know, super kind and answered millions of questions of mine. And, uh, you know, so he so his uh, like his examples of his work back when I was really young were really important to propelling me forward to learn and to be try, try to be as good as him. And I wanted to really put a lot of those answers in there for fans of my work. So it was, yeah, I just tried to put as much stuff in there as I could. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of influences, you mentioned Richard Garriott and how you played all the Ultima games. And you said you were sort of waiting in line at the store as each one came out. And yeah. so I'm a huge Ultima fan. I've uh, covered it extensive, covered the series extensively on this podcast. I actually just got married a month or two ago and I worked the, you know, the the truth, love, and courage into my wedding vows. I mean, that's how, wow. how big I'm into it. Congrats. That's great that you, uh, that you did the, the, the TLC stuff in there. That's awesome. Yeah. So I was, I was wondering, could you just talk more about how much of an influence did Ultima have on you? Were you influenced by the eight virtues? Anything like I that? was, yeah, I would. Well, the thing is, I thought that that was great. Like obviously Ultima four was a watershed moment in RPG history because the design of that game was masterful and it was, you know, exhaustive. It was awesome. The amount of stuff you had to do for each of those virtues was great. Um, and I love the fact that you, that you couldn't actually know where you were at on them <laughs> if you were really doing well or not. Um, but the whole series, you know, when I first, the first Ultima I saw was in 1981, Ultima 1 had just come out and it was being played at my high school and everybody crowded around watching this person. And I even saw Mondane, you know, the very end where he defeat Mondane. Um, it was just, I was just blown away by it. And then Ultima 2 comes out and he programmed in assembly language, which really blew me away. And everybody just in the industry was, was was surprised and and really happy that there was a massive upgrade to the technology of Ultima. And uh, I, I beat Ultima 2 multiple times. I even wrote a, a character customizer for it <laughs> where I could take the character disc and modify it. Hmm. Um, Ultima 3 was huge in 1983, finding out, well, I don't want to give away, not that people would <laughs> play it, but like who um, Exodus was uh, at the end. So cool. As I finished all of these games, Ultima 4 was massive. I played Ultima 4 all the way through, um, all the way down into the abyss, Stygian abyss, and, and uh, became an avatar and everything. And Ultima 5 actually was my favorite one because it had the two huge, like, you know, um, amazing uh, accomplishments in the game. The first one where you have to take down the three Shadow Lords, and then you have to rescue Lord British from the mirror in uh, dungeon doom and uh and i thought that was just amazing to have those two huge moments in the game and also have just another replication of well it's not rep the, the size replication of the the uh overworld into the underworld and to have that massive amount of stuff and following the piece of paper that came in the game that takes you all the way to the the journey that that uh lord british and everybody took into the underworld and you can follow that path and get to the point where all the graves are and everything. It was just amazing. Yeah. It's what, when I think back on it now, it just seems like such a amazing, like weird thing to exist. This game where the, the, the game designer is in the game is the character who rules this <laughs> lands. And you know, the, the goal of the fourth game is basically to, to live a life of virtue. And everyone told him he was crazy. And he's like, well, it's my company and this is the game we're making. And yep. All that in the um, cloth maps and feelies and I loved that. all of that. The pad, the the box itself with the lid coming down on top. All of the, all of the the books that came with it. Um, the maps were my favorite. I have a framed Ultima Two map signed by Richard Garriott in my office above my desk. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah that's it's, awesome. Yeah, I mean Richard was a hero. You know, he was a rock star in the industry. Um, he was just unbelievable. You know, I've just really looked up to him a lot. Um, and, and because of that, my first job was at origin. <laughs> I mean, do you feel like that's a, that Ultima is just sort of like a thing that could only exist at that particular time and place, or is it possible for, for something that sort of personal well, and 
I think Odd Ultima, to... you know, I think that Ultima, obviously, it existed at that point. I'd say Final Fantasy is another instantiation of, you know, that kind of, you know, epic storytelling across many games. And, you know, Final Fantasy is up to, I think, 16 or something now. <laughs> it's massive. And what's crazy is that my, you know, other game hero created the first three Final Fantasies, Nasser Jabelli. Um, but but yeah, Final Fantasy, I'd say, is another like, you know, great, strong series uh, of games. But yeah, you know, it was it was a uh, wizardry existed back then. It was also a major contender for, you know, the number one RPG. Uh, you know, it was it was it was written back in, you know, a really early time of uh, the, the very beginning of the industry. And it was amazing that both wizardry and Ultima could could um, just capture an audience like that. I'm still just kind of blown away by what Richard had done um, in, you know, back then um with uh with ultima you know just the imagination translated into an 8-bit computer and that people could experience that um it was it was really impressive yeah i also want to tell there's a part in the book where you describe going out to dinner with ken and roberta williams at erna's elderberry house and you say you know it was this really fancy restaurant it was a like a cool experience and stuff and i was just curious if you have you read um ken williams book or how do you know his have you heard his take on this story yeah, yeah. Um, I've, 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 uh, haven't read the whole thing. I had to make sure that I read, um, the part where I'm at in his book, <laughs> just because he, you know, I'm talking about Ken in my book, but he already had talked about meeting Ed software in his book. Um, so I wanted to make sure that that was all good. Um, but I am looking forward to reading about it. Um, because, you know, he was, a, a he was one of the heads of the industry back then. And, uh, you know, he's telling his his story um, from his viewpoint. And I think, and I, you know, I, I think it's really important for the game devs to get their stories out there. I'd love to read more books from more developers that uh, that have made some, you know, pretty, pretty cool games. I'll just explain for listeners, like the way that Ken Williams tells it is that this he took you to the fanciest restaurant in town that had this strict dress code. And you guys showed up <laughs> and like ripped jeans and like... Came out of a band. T-shirts and things, and, <laughs> and that the uh, the the owner was was sort of like well, giving him the side eye, and but yeah. since he was such a big customer, she sort of was forced to let you guys come in in the ripped jeans and everything. Yep, yeah, and really, Ken owned that town. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he did. He was the biggest employer for decades in that town, um, and that was a really great restaurant. We had a room that was just like the longest table with a fireplace at the end and doors closed. And, you know, I'll never forget it. It was, it was, it was a really great moment. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask you about um, John Carmack's D and D games. Um, I thought that this, this is from your book. I thought this description was really evocative. You say uh, we stumbled upon vampire castles with crystal coffins on an underground shore traveled with the silver shadow band on the back of a silver dragon to a forbidden land watched a super being named Quake as he destroyed parts of huge buildings with his hammer and attempted a smash and grab in a fortress. Uh, it just sounds like like a really amazing uh, it was, campaign. It was unbelievable. And there's so many more adventures than that. You know, like, <laughs> it was just crazy. Even like Daikatana, even even like the, the, the weapon, the Daikatana weapon I got that inspired the, the name for the game came from part of the part of this adventure where we were having we we're trying to escape um this one super powerful character and I ran off with this other with one per we our our band our group kind of split off to just hide. Um and I took off with this one guy, Vade, who had a castle in a pocket dimension. And so I went with him into this castle where you can't be found, you know, and like e each of the other people in our group had had to hide out in their own places, too. And it was just like, how crazy only in D&D &D can something like this happen? You know, um, it, the adventures we had were just legendary. They were just amazing. So many great characters. It was have the, like a super complex political system in the game that you know we were becoming aware of as we're like these lowly peons under trying to understand the world that we were in and all the power plays going on. And we're just like, <laughs> we're lucky to even be around these super powerful people. 
Um, but I, yeah, we'll never forget the crazy stuff that happened. I think Tom Hall even kept a like a journal for a while of of the stuff that happened. Oh, does, is that still around, or does it still exist? He, he yeah, I think he might have it somewhere. I'm going to have to a- ask him to dig it up because it's pretty good. Yeah, that'd be cool if it were ever just posted online or published or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing that sort of struck me reading that is, you know, all the stuff I've read about John Carmack, he's sort of portrayed as like really um, single-mindedly focused on work and code and really sort of dismissive of story and games. And it just seems like an odd sort of um, to like, how do you square that with this, that he was the DM of this campaign that sounds like it just had this amazing story and, you know, all this like crazy creativity and stuff. Yep. Yeah. I mean, he did create stories on the fly for us while we're playing D and D. So he's, he, he created an amazing world that we could play in and the stories that happened, you know, a lot of those came from him and were in a, were a consequence of our actions inside that world. Um, but you know, when it got to the point when we were making games, uh, the games that we were making at that time that we were like, when we were starting to innovate on that stuff, they didn't need the stories that we could, that anyone else would probably put into them because the, the focus of those games at that time wasn't story. The focus was the technology and the speed, you know? So, you know, John is, is he's been portrayed like a, you know, like a computer, but you know, uh, and sure his brain can work like that, but he's super creative. He's a super creative person He's really fun, good friend, and um, and just you know, um, he's like unlike yeah, you know, like anyone else I've ever met or read about. He's just incredible. Actually, as, as I was reading this book, it was reminding me that so before Quake came out, there was something called Quake Talk, was which was this compilation of every rumor, you know, t- tidbit of information that had been said yep. anywhere about Quake. And actually, the first time I ever went on the internet, I searched for inf- Quake Info and I found Quake Talk. Nice. And so I used to just, you know, I printed it out and I just used to sit in my backyard reading it over and over again and imagining what the game was going to be like. And so there are sort of two quotes from it that are sort of burned into my memory. So I'm just curious. Hmm. I'm curious to, I've always been curious to ask you about these. So one <laughs> of them is you say uh, basically that in Quake, you won't just be pointing and clicking to kill things. You'll have to just really beat the shit out of them with a hammer and they'll, you know, <laughs> beat them into bloody paste and all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I was just curious if, um, if, if, you, if you think something like God of War or Elden Ring, is that sort of what you were imagining or, or has what you were imagining initially for Quake never yet really been done? Um, I think some games have gotten close. Um, but not quite like the the image that you had just <laughs> described that was in there. Um, you know, so so that hasn't happened because a lot of times when you have a you know combat in a game, you know, players want to to it, it I guess the the timing of combat has has changed over the years. And if you if you look at something like mortar, um, you know, the game of swords and stuff, uh you know that that game is like people are taking you know hand to hand combat in a totally different direction and a lot of it is people people are really good nowadays and people are really fast at playing games so i don't think a slow approach would work again um but you know even so there was an original design for quake but when we changed the design to be an fps i'm really happy with how quake turned out it's exactly the game that it was meant to be Mm-hmm. I, I haven't played that mortar game, but I always imagined somehow that you would be like swinging the mouse around and the hammer would be swinging. You know, I don't know how that would work exactly. I know. I know. Well, it was going to it was going to be an R&D effort for sure <laughs> to try and figure that out. But we never got to that point. Mm. And then the other thing is just you you would you describe very vividly how the character would be walking through a forest and maybe you would see a cave and just looking at this cave would cause a monster's red eyes to start glowing yeah. and the monster would charge out at you and stuff. And I, yeah, I can't view really, triggers. Yeah. yeah. Is that a thing? I, I don't remember really. I haven't really come across that in other, other games. Yeah. The, so those, so view triggers are used um, kind of sparingly and a lot of times for just VFX in games, but I wanted view trigger, a view trigger to be, you know, used specifically in certain instances, like you shouldn't look at that thing, you know, and it's like, um, I haven't you know, like, like the only 
things that I've seen uh, in games that kind of use that as a game mechanic would be games like, say, the Hitman games, where you're trying to avoid the eyes of some of the enemies, you know, because if they if they can recognize you, then you could be caught and that's kind of it, you know, so you have to look away and kind of walk in a different direction. And that's that's a, a cool way to use the, you know, the player's visual I, you know, line of sight in a game design instead of just as a as a, a an effect of looking into the sun or something like that. So, hmm. um, so yeah, I'd say you know more more design around view triggers. You know, you can make a, an environment even more hostile if you can't look at it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a really cool sort of Lovecraftian thing, right? If you have some unholy symbol or horrifying monster or something, if you stare at it for too long, you die or go and yeah or we'll say the enderman right in minecraft you know if you look at the enderman he's going to teleport right to where you're at so you have to avoid the enderman uh looking at him you can look at him from the edge of your screen but you can't have him in the center mm -hmm. do you think you might ever do some sort of like like go back to that original quake design and implement it in some um some fashion geez probably not you know um there's a lot of i have there's so many game ideas that like I, I've never really gone back to an old idea to make, you know, some sometime uh, later. It's always been the game idea happens at the time when I'm ready to make something, and the the platform it's going to be on, and the in the you know design angle that it needs to be on, or that that it needs to 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 be new. I'd say, um, like with Sigil. You know, Sigil was like expanding Doom. It's like going back to Doom, but it was a celebration of Doom's 25th anniversary. So um, I went back and did that and tried to kind of innovate as much as I could with with an uh, with a game that was was older like that. But yeah, um, games change a lot during development. And Quake is really an example of how drastically games can change during development. And it, but it's true for every game. Your your initial idea about a game is never going to be what you ship. If you've, you know, if you have responded to the game's play and have tried to capitalize on the strengths of that play, sometimes it steers you in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say a little bit more about what Sigil is for listeners? You're, you've, you've gone back and made these, Doom, you know, levels for the original Doom, these new levels. Yeah, yeah. Doom, originally when we launched the game, had three episodes. Then in 1995, when we put the retail version of Doom into stores, we called it the Ultimate Doom, and we uh, added a fourth episode. So it, it was called Thy Flesh Consumed is the name of that fourth episode. And that was in 1995. So now that I'm, uh, you know, 2018 was the 25th anniversary of Doom. Uh, I wanted to to do something. And normally, like every year, I'll tweet something about Doom. Happy birthday, Doom. You're <laughs> 19 years old or whatever. And so this time I was like, what can I do more than just tweet, you know, something saying happy birthday? 25 years is pretty significant. So I thought, you know what? What if I just made another episode? You know, so I thought about it. I was like, where would I put that episode? It'll be episode five because it comes right after four and I'm not going to overwrite an episode because you can do that when you're making wads. You can just say this episode overwrites all of episode three or something. But I felt like I want to include all the original ones and add an episode. So episode five is the episode. Um, and then I had to, then I wanted to come up with just a design that was going to be kind of new and consistent through all of the levels. So I came up with this idea of this thing called, I call it Baphomet's eye and it uses the evil eye, uh, icon in the game and uh and so what you do is whenever you see this eye it's really easy to see because it's always bright um if you see it you want to shoot and when you shoot it it closes up and you can't shoot it again but it opens something up and it either opens up your pathway forward through the level or it opens up a secret near you and that was a really fun consistent design thing they put through all the levels that people just don't see in you know um in just the wads that people put out there so people really liked it you know it was really fun going in and making those levels it was easy because i've just it, i've made so many doom levels <laughs> back in the hmm. day that it, that it's i fully understand all of it so it was really just me learning doom builder 2's 
uh, keyboard commands and stuff so I could just use the editor to make the stuff. And it was a much better editor than the one I wrote on Next Step back in 1993. Hmm. I mean, I spent a lot of time in high school making Doom levels, and it was just so much fun. And I feel like Doom is just the perfect, you know, the perfect point of like awesomeness of game um, as a ratio to ease of content creation. You know, that like... Yeah. Once, once the technology got more advanced, it became so labor intensive to make the levels that became less fun. And Doom is just sort of this inflection point where those two things, you know, the, the fun of the game and the fun of making stuff for the game, which is perfectly balanced. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for the nice words on Doom uh, that you're totally right. Before Doom was Wolfenstein and that was too simple, right? It was it was it was just too simple. And doom was the next level up but it was such a perfect level of of um complexity it wasn't too complex it was understandable and it was easy and fast to do um with today's tools with say ultimate doom builder you can quickly you know just create a room by just selecting the rectangle tool and drawing a rectangle and put the, your player in it and run it it's that easy it takes less than a minute um so the tools are really great, um, but the but it's easy to make really good looking levels with Doom because the engine, um, so kind of makes the levels spooky already with the diminished lighting. You know, no matter where you're at, it's going to get darker into the distance, and uh, the you know using line segments to draw the walls and all the textures that you already have as a palette of you know of textures. Um, it's really easy to just put stuff together. You know, just slamming it together. For me, it takes a lot longer for for um, to build sigil levels because I need to be technically as good as I can be, uh, just because you know people could tear tear it apart <laughs> on the internet and go, well, he can't even align textures or whatever. <laughs> so um, so I have to take extra extra time to make sure it looks great, but it also the data is in a really good shape. Um, so that takes a lot longer, but most people don't are not concerned about that. Um, but yeah, it's really great to hear that you're part of the, the Doom mod community. Yeah, I mean, just, just last night, I, I watched this video on YouTube of you playing this myhouse.wad. I was just going to mention that. It's just, yeah, and, and just like, I think, I assume one person made it. I mean, but it, it's something like so crazy that, you know, to make it, you know, for like, you know, the Doom Eternal or something, you didn't need 100 people to do it. But, you know, in, in Doom, like someone can make something, you know, did you, they can just let their imagination run wild and create all this crazy stuff. Yep. And it is scary. I was like yeah. walking around my house after watching this and I was just really, really disconcerted. It was creepy. Really, really great. You know, um, and it's and it's pretty amazing that 30 years later, right after Doom, we have one of the best wads made. You would think that that would have happened in the 90s, right? In the late 90s. It's happening today. Um just because the love for Doom is still strong, the community is massive, uh, the source ports are incredible, um, and the support for that game is unlike anything in history. Right? There's no other game that has had this level of support for 30 years and still has some of the best stuff released at you know 30 years later. It's just incredible. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say for listeners, if you if you're not you know ready to uh, you know, fire up Doom and load in this wad and everything. There's a, a YouTube video called My House Wad Inside Doom's Most Terrifying Wad. This is W A D capital. Uh, and so, if you're just curious, I'd encourage everyone to check it out because it's sort of it's it's a guy goes through and explains all the all the stuff, and it's it's really it's like a work of art. It's really uh, just surreal and and fascinating. Yep. Um. Okay. So so one experience that that I had playing Doom and Quake is that, so, okay, so in the original rules for Doom, um, basically you could pick up each weapon once and you got a certain supply of ammo that you couldn't really get back unless you died and you couldn't really get your health back. And I felt like, and I, I've talked about this on the show, so listeners will be familiar with with this, but, um, and I felt like it made it more fun for newcomers because if you were um, not as good, you could still kill, you know, no matter how much better you were than somebody, uh, they were still going to kill you eventually when you ran out of health and ran out of ammo and you were down to the chainsaw and they had the, you know, rocket launcher <laughs> or whatever. And that the rules changed in Quake to make it so that every all the um, ammo and health and everything respawns. And so it made it much easier for a, 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 the superior player to just completely dominate the uh, dominate the competition. You're talking and, about deathmatch, right? 
in, in death yeah yeah i mean <laughs> particularly one-on-one death match but but yes. yeah in death match yeah and so i've always um i've always sort of thought about that and wondered if there should be more games that sort of you know made it harder and harder to keep the more you keep winning the harder and harder it gets to keep winning to make it more fun for everybody you're sort of handicapped the more the more winning you get yeah i think that people have thought about some of those some of those rules you know some ideas for those rules in in doom we created a dash alt death and i think that that uh put the respawning of uh of everything back in because people did need to pick up you know health and stuff again later so i think that we stuck that in in a in an update probably you know one point uh four or five something like that maybe um but quake had it already you know and it was really easy to change that in quake because because quake had a programmable language you could just edit the progs file and just do whatever you wanted with anything but um people people um you know really really do like having the respawn stuff because uh having respawning health and all that because when everything's gone it's 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 a it's a very different strategy <laughs> when everything's gone when things respawn it's you know, there's a route that people need to keep up you know and uh and that route is really important in quake knowing how what you because because it helps your prediction if someone thinks that they're like owning that level and they're doing it by picking everything up that's respawning then it's great for you to predict the next move that they're going to make to take them out and also just the fact that every five minutes the pent and the quad respawn and and, and the invisibility and those are critical power-ups to get to basically turn the tables in a match that's you know maybe going bad for you mm-hmm. i mean what do you think though about does that make it too challenging for or sort of frustrating for new players who can just never get a kill if they're not pattern running the quad damage or something um, if you mean if there's no respawning of health and stuff no no i'm saying if there is if everything's respawning and mm-hmm. the expert player knows exactly when the you know the health pack's going to appear here and they pick it up as soon as it appears and the quad damage is going to appear here and they pick it up as soon as as it appears it's really hard for someone who's new to the game to it is to it get is any kind of yeah the game doesn't have handicapping built in it doesn't have like ranks ranking or any of that stuff because it was too early for us you know to to kind of think about that even though esports were right around the corner but even in esports they would not do that <laughs> you know um cuz esports is all about expert players that can that understand control of a map um so yeah for 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 beginner players i'd say you need to find other beginners and and be in a like a maybe a LAN game where everybody's trying to learn how to do better. You know, we actually had done that at work for you know a, a long time, where where people who are learning Quake are in a specific server, and people are t- telling each other they're showing each other through the map. They're showing you like invisible areas that you can run on over lava, or they're they're showing you where each of the major power ups are at, and kind of teaching each other, and then talk you know techniques for rocket jumping and techniques for lightning gunning people um and rocketing them and like, you know so there's like the the learning server and then there's the expert server and uh and like when you play someone who's really good like say uh thresh i played thresh um at my house back in the 90s like no one in in the game like there was there was i think about four of us or five of us playing this one match we didn't even see him he was we were just dying <laughs> he teleported and this is like on map one which is not really a deathmatch map people you play but on map one he's just like teleporting in throwing grenades and going away and so you're just like coming around the corner right into grenades and how did he even know that you were going there you know his prediction everything he was just like the most amazing first esports you know player ever it's just awesome yeah i mean do you think that arena shooters will make a comeback i mean because that my perception anyway is that games like quake champions and lawbreakers that it was just you know they tried to do um you know matching players of equivalent skill and stuff like that but it just you know it was just too frustrating for new players and i would love to see arena shooters make a big comeback so i just wonder if there's some some solution to that that issue i I feel that that someone will try to solve the disparity kind of problem with people's, you know, the, with, obviously you can um, you can make it so when somebody's uh, spawning on a server that their rank 
it takes into account which server they're going to be, you know, joining. So, you know, there's a bunch of rules that people think um, are, are thinking about, but but there's not, you know, like the return of arena shooters yet. And what I really liked back then, like, no matter what, when it comes to deathmatch, my favorite is one on one. I love one on one. I'm not an FFA fan. And I was I was a big fan in Quake 3 of Rocket Arena 3, where you are in a queue with a bunch of other people watching a match that's a one-on-one -on -one match. And when somebody dies, the next person slots in and starts a new match. And, you know, I love that Rocket Arena style. I thought that was really great. You know, you have a lot of spectators, people who are observing and watching the different strategies and stuff. Um, but, uh, in, and so, yeah, I like one-on-one -on -one more than FFA. FFA is is fun because there's a ton of targets out there but you know it's for me it's about the strategy and the psychology of playing in a level that both people know and you're trying to out psych each other and that's super fun you can't out psych people you can't out psych someone when there's you know 20 people <laughs> in the level running around everywhere there's no psychology going on there so to me it's like that extra depth of of play with the psychology so yeah, I shouldn't have said I'm not a fan of it. I'm just like one-on-one -on -one more. I've played lots of FFA. In fact, I really like Battle Royale, which is like the biggest FFA there is. Yeah, no, but I, I agree 100%. I mean, I, I just feel like, you know, I mean, it was all we could do back in the serial cable <laughs> days. Yep. But, you know, that there there was just something really cerebral about just one-on-one -on -one in a level that you both know by heart. I that, absolutely loved it. That's always the most fun for me is knowing the level really well and knowing that I'm playing with someone who knows the level really well. And I still play, you know, I still play Doom. I still play Quake. Um, with Doom, you know, there's a lot of really great psychology there. My lead programmer is basically almost esports level. He's exceptional. His name is Ronan. And, uh, and we play Quake death matches. Uh, we have death match tournaments on Thursdays in the office. And it's just, you know, he's just incredible. He's super amazing. It's so fun to play people who are really good because, you know, you can learn something from them. From them. <laughs> this is your, your lead programmer on your new modern shooter that you're yes. not um, revealing any uh, yep. details yeah, my, about? My uh, lead programmer on the uh, FPS that we're working on, his name is Ronan Pierce. Um, yeah, and he's he is... Uh, Incredible programmer, incredible gamer, and incredible person. Mm -hmm. You say in the book, yeah, that you're working on, quote, a modern shooter that pairs modern tech with a combination of old school and contemporary design sensibilities. So that sounds yep, awesome that's... to me. Definitely looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. Yep, I can't say any more about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me ask you, too. I mean, so in the book, um, you know, because I sort of, you know, I, I, I'd read, you know, Masters of Doom and um, David Craddock's book, Rocket Jump and stuff like that. So I, I, I knew the story pretty well, but there was a lot of stuff in this book that was new to me. And including you give all the, the exact addresses of um, a lot of the places where this stuff was happening. So like 7450 South Lakeshore Drive in Shreveport. Yeah. And I live in Austin now and I'm kind of like, wow, some of these, you know, like Mesquite and Shreveport are, you know, within driving distance. So I could maybe yeah. do a little pilgrimage to some of these places. So I was wondering there's, if there's well, really yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so I was just, I was just wondering, yeah. Like, do you think, uh, would that be cool to, to drive by? And is there anything else uh, I should check out in the area or on the way? Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, thanks. I think it's cool that you that you do that, these pilgrimages. I've done my own, you know, to like every location that Sierra Online uh, had in in, in uh, Oakhurst. Um, but let's say with the Id Lake House on Lake South Lakeshore, there's actually a YouTube video of someone who went out there and recorded it. <laughs> so you can just watch it without having to go all over there. But you know, <laughs> somebody's house, so they'd probably be worried if if they saw a bunch of cars hanging out outside, you know. But um, but but somebody had a YouTube video and did a YouTube video. They did this exact same pilgrimage. I have a feeling, I don't remember 100%, but I have a feeling that in the video, they also went to see Soft Disk's building at 606 Common Street, which I believe is also in the in the book. And it still says Soft Disk on the building. Um, oh, wow. But the funny thing about that, um, I can't remember if it's in the book or not, but the, the place where we all worked was not in that building on 606 common it was on milam which is just around the corner and it was a much nicer building um 
so yeah so that's so that's the the place where we actually did all the programming of, of everything um but the but the yeah the the, the softest building or the the lake house that was listed for sale a while ago um but the pool and the whole back deck and the huge yard and all that stuff is still there yeah that's cool i mean that kind of makes it kind of easy if it's on youtube that sort of sort of spoils the fun but i guess you know <laughs> not everybody can can, can go to shreveport, shreveport louisiana <laughs> and then try and, and and see this place um there's there are um there's these books that are called the the engine black book for Wolfenstein 3D and Doom and I think the Quake one is being worked on, and in those books I drew the uh, office maps for where we were at when we were working on those games at id Software. So for Wolfenstein, um, you have the uh, I think the the house in uh, or the apartment in Madison, Wisconsin that we were living in or we were doing id software out of, which was John Carmack's apartment. And then uh, when we moved to Dallas, then the new office there, uh, which was another apartment <laughs> for id software, um, that layout of that apartment also. And then with Doom, when we finally got an office building, that next book, I drew out the entire layout of the whole office there for where we were at and where people were sitting. So there's a little bit more detail in some books. And um, and we sell those books on our site on Romero.com if anybody wants to get these massively technical books but if you if you want to know what the uh what it was like and what we were what we had to do to make our games go at the speed that they were going these books spend about half the book setting the stage for the exact hardware that was available to us the year that those games were made in detail and then it goes into the source code afterwards so it's really for anybody who's an engineer or or interested in really technical detail these books are pretty cool for for another really deep look at at what we actually did on the games, um, where you can just look at the technology versus hear the stories. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I mean, I, I probably am not going to look through the code that in that much detail, but I, I would definitely like to look at those uh, those floor plans. That would be really interesting. And yeah, it, it's just so, so interesting to me to read about this about these games in this time period and everything. I mean, I read your book in like a day, like a day and a half or something. Oh, like that not, fast. <laughs> yeah, like not, I didn't take a single, I mean, I slept, but I didn't, you know, I was just reading it nonstop. I mean, I was totally um, engrossed by it. How did you read it in a day? That's like 368 pages. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, don't try this at home, kids. I'm a <laughs> yeah, professional, professional reader. Book reviewer, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I got up in the morning, I read, you know, two thirds of it, and then I got up the next morning and finished it. Um, but wow. yeah. Uh, no, I can read nonfiction. Like fiction, I'm not that fast at reading, but nonfiction, I can I can read really fast. So wow, interesting. Uh, especially if it's a, I mean, it helps a lot if it's a subject I'm really really interested in. Uh, yeah, and did you were were you interested in all these little details? Like what was what was it like in the room where we were making Commander Keen and stuff like that? Or yeah, what, sure, no, all yeah, all of it. Because I mean, you know, like yeah, like when I was growing up, I mean, you know, there was like Quake Talk, and that was sort of you know. That was all, you know, I guess you guys had your plan files and stuff like that. But I mean, there was yeah, definitely a, a, a huge, you know, gap between what I wanted to know and what was available. And so to have all this stuff filled in kind of retroactively is reading all these books, you know, you know, Kushner's and Craddock's and, and so on, you know, is nice. just really, really fascinating. Yeah, Yust Sure is the person who did Quake Talk. And I think he had a site called Slipgate Central back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I actually got myself into Quake Talk. It was a big accomplishment at the time. I, I, I forget what it was now. I, I passed along some, um, some detail and, and, and they, I got my name listed in the, you know, in the credits somewhere. Um, there was actually, I was sort of a little bit notorious because on the message boards I had suggested in Quake, wouldn't it be cool if you just take all the dead bodies you had killed in the entire level and pile them all up and use that to get up to a platform that you wouldn't be able to otherwise reach. <laughs> and uh and there was a huge discussion about that where people were telling me what an idiot I was, what idiot I was and how that would slow down the game and stuff like that but people were still talking like for years people were still talking about that wow that thread, this so. is during development cuz people didn't really know what the game was at that time yeah. i mean they knew what the game was from reading irc and you know magazine articles and all the you know previews and stuff like that um and that totally would have fit in with the design of the game at that time too. 
No, we had, we knew absolutely nothing. I mean, it, and like what I was because you you guys had said you know that um, Quake will be a bigger jump over Doom than Doom is over Wolfenstein yeah. 3D. And so, like in my image, I was imagining like Elden Ring, like literally, like what I was imagining, you know, was was so ridiculously impossible. Like my expectations were so like ridiculously out of touch with you know yeah. any sort of reality. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, it was it was um, making the world full three D was really the biggest part of that technology that was really difficult to make. It was a huge jump from Doom's top-down 2D uh, line segments. You know, it was it was a lot, um, and uh, but it was really you know it was just what a journey making that game was. Um, but it was you know it it, it 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 you know it was so it's such an important game. Quake was such an important game that I wanted to make sure we had enough that that I had enough chapters in there going over the entire process of development of that game because n- there wasn't anything out there that was th- that in depth you know um so it, especially from the viewpoint of somebody who's on the team yeah i mean i can even just imagine you know having conversations with people saying like oh wouldn't it be so amazing if you could just like the character if there was like angle deep water in the game and you could just step into the water and your feet would be under the water you know how cool would that be yeah and then there was just a point where somebody on the team said oh you'll be able to go underwater and quake and that was just like mind blown like how is that even you yeah know, that was one, one thing where it exceeded my expectations for how for what i was imagining yeah, the water really was a big deal, especially when you look at Doom and the Doom tech games, um, you know, where you are standing on water. <laughs> so it was uh, it was it was huge. And, and, and it was a big decision, too. It's like, well, if we're going to go underwater, what can we do underwater? It'd be nice if everything that we were doing underwater was exactly the same as above water, except your movement is different because you're, you're in water. So shooting rockets and everything, and it was like lightning is very special underwater. So that <laughs> we have to have to make sure that that is done right. Um, but uh, but yeah, the the physics of everything, the moving through the water and swimming and getting out of it was so smooth. You know, getting up out of the water was just like so easy. It's almost like what mantling is like today. You know, just automatic and just happens. It's really fast. Um, but we did that back then because like, that's how you want it to feel. You know, I want it to feel fast. I want to have like a big old, it's going to take a while to get out of the, out of the water. Cause you're just dead in death match. Like going into the water is a death sentence. If you, if you're going to try and get out of it and, you know, laboriously climb up out of the water, you're gone, you know? So it had to be fast. Um, but all of those design decisions, you know, we're all based off of actually playing, playing against each other, um, understanding you know just like okay we can't have this slow down in here or we need this thing picked up more i need more of a, a boost if i'm rocketing off an angle um just stuff like that like a whole bunch of little decisions for uh acceleration speed of the player friction on the ground um side to side movement speeds um air control especially how much air control can you have um just everything it was just so much tweaking to make sure that it felt really really good that the movement model is great and still today when you're in quake and you throw a grenade and you hear it banging off the walls and stuff it feels like the most solid game ever still you know like that was you feel like that's a real world you know yeah absolutely and I, i'm having a blast talking about all this stuff people can probably tell but uh we're, we're pretty much out of time so i can <laughs> <laughs> let you go um but is there anything else any final thoughts or anything about the book that we didn't talk about or just anything you want listeners to to know about um i think that if you're looking for more information about all the cool stuff that happened back in the day um i tried to put all of the really good information in this book that you wouldn't find in other places and so that's one of the one of the one of the big pluses i'd say for for uh for for getting this book you know it's it's a it's a chronicle of early game development by a team uh you know that was that was trying to to make the best games ever and it goes all the way up to today and everything that's happened so um yeah i think i think there's a lot in there and it's a really good game history book for people who are interested in game history because there's a lot of stuff in it yeah i like i said i I just loved it there's tons of stuff about your childhood which is really fascinating there's all this stuff about doom and quake there's all this stuff about you know adversity and 
you know, dealing with adversity with grace and, you know, and it seems like you've come to a really good place after everything that happened. And, um, like, like he's like, um, I think readers were telling you that it's a, you know, it's, it has a positive attitude and is very gracious. And I really appreciated that about the book. And so, yeah, like I, like I was saying, I mean, I read it again in a day or two and, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's really, really, uh, it was really, really a thrill to, to, to find out all this stuff and to relive a lot of these very happy memories of uh, of these games that I loved so much. Well, that's awesome. Thanks so much for reading my book in an incredible day. <laughs> and I do, I just hope the people who grew up like I did will find hope in this book when they read it and they kind of see, yeah, you can still, you can still have a great life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, so, so we've been speaking with John Romero and again, this new book is called Doom Guy. So John, thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thank you very much. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to John Romero for joining us on the show. This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit GeeksGuideShow.com. To learn more about your host, visit DavidBarrKirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.